just bless this time. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. Sing that again. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that
I'm going to be reading Matthew 4, 17 through 20. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. I'm just going to pray for our church, and uh, on my heart this week is baby Emma Walton, and I want to lift her up as well. Dear Lord, I just thank you for this community in the South Bay that worships you, that praises you, and that seeks after you. Um, and today I lift up baby Emma Walton, and that you would just place your healing hands on her that you would look after her and the Walton family and that you would comfort them. Uh, and I just ask that the support of this community would be poured over them and that you would just lift them up. And I just thank you for the blessings that you have poured over all of us. And I just ask that you would continue to draw our hearts near to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Lord, thank you that we can, regardless of our situation, we can lean back into you wherever we are on the map of a trial, on the map of um, our life, a season of life, a relationship, something we've been praying for and praying for and praying for, and we don't see an answer or we don't see an opening. We can lean back and know we are in our loving Father's arms, and Lord, you see everything. And so we take great comfort in that, deep, deep comfort in that. And we thank you for the privilege of coming together to celebrate those um, life-changing truths. We love you and we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much. You can grab a seat, everybody. It's so good to see you out there. It's a warm Labor Day weekend, September 1st. Great to see you. Before I go any further, we here at the River Church of the South Bay care about you body, mind, soul. I have some sunscreen here. Does anyone forget sunscreen and is sitting there going, I don't want to burn. If that's you, I'm going to put it right here during the meet and greet. Come use some sunscreen, people. That way it could be a write-off for me too. So me bringing this here is technically a charitable donation. That's a joke, people. (laughs) It's good to be with you. We have a good space in the front here in case Todd gets really charismatic and wants some people running back and forth during the service. Uh, But if during the meet and greet you wanted to fill that in, we're not going to be mad at you. We do have, like, coffee and donuts in the back. Hallelujah. Thank you. I mean, if there's not something that brings people together like that. Ron, thanks for being under the tent for us. He's going to lead a revival right there by himself. And... um, And hey, if you're new with us, if it's your first time, first time in a long time, we are so thankful that you're here. Um, It's just good to see people. I saw Theo in the ocean just a few minutes ago. Not a bad idea during meet and greet. I might do something similar. Um, We want to say if it's, if you want to get connected, you want to know a little bit more about what, what we do, who we are. We are followers of Jesus. We follow the way of Jesus. And, um, and you'll be hearing more about that as you um, sit this morning, we open the word and, and just listen from the ancient inspired scriptures and say, how can we learn today from this timeless book, uh, compilation of books? And we're also a very relational, I mean, highly, highly relational people. And if you say that, it kind of makes you wonder, like, is that true? If you have to say you're highly relational, are you? Just wait for a little bit, you'll see. This, this community, it's one of the things I love about it um, is it goes beyond just listening, hearing, doing stuff. It's like we do it together. We really are a community. And so um, we always like to share stories, not just give you announcements, like here's stuff to keep in mind, but to actually share stories of lives and people um, who have taken different on-ramps into the community here or God has sort of moved them to get involved in um, what the Lord is up to on this beautiful planet. And uh, there's this I want to invite up the Accardos. Um, come on up here, Amelia. Come on up here, um, and and let's let's have a, a big round of applause for literally Tony has y'all have led the Accardos have led Baja Bound for like several 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 years. And my math isn't good, so I don't even know how many seven years. Oh my word, what a biblical number. Um, and so I just want to just give a chance for y'all to share a little bit about what does this trip mean to you? Why are you doing this? Like you have other things. You're, you guys are a really important family. You could do a lot of stuff. Why are you doing this? So truth be told, I was sitting at church for a couple of years, and there was this big guy named Ernesto, Ernesto. that uh, kept bringing up his wonderful journey down to Baja. And it's a trip of a bunch of you guys and kids and we go down and we build homes for the, uh, the working poor down there. So Amelia's done it for about six years with me. Asher, how many homes have you built? I've built two. He's built two houses. So the age is no, no disruption in things. I think Asher came when he was six years old. Amelia's now 15 and more excited than ever. I want Amelia to tell her, her story that she prepared. Um, So going to Baja Bound is a really amazing way to change families' lives and experience new cultures very different from ones in PV. Um, By the end of the trip, lives in Mexico and the lives of all the volunteers have been changed. Um, While we're there, we create such a good bond with the family and awesome to hear all their stories and see how much this means to them. 
One of my favorite memories is painting the walls or playing soccer with all the neighborhood kids. Or when my mom and I took the women of both the households we were building homes for that year grocery shopping. You would think they would both start loading their carts with everything they could get their hands on, but they only took exactly what they needed. However, one of the moms bought almost 50 eggs in one big carton to feed all of the neighborhood. So once we got to the car, we had to figure out how to get the eggs back on miles down a dirt, bumpy, rocky road without all the eggs breaking. I can't tell you how impressed my mom and I were that once we had gotten back, she had made it miles down it while without breaking a single egg with them in her lap. After just a few days, we returned home with such an accomplished feeling and an appreciation for the simple things we usually take for granted. Going to Baja Bound is such an eye-opening experience that really makes you appreciate everything from warm showers to paved roads. So how about that? So uh, our next trip that we're coordinating right now, uh, it begins on October 12th, which is a, a holiday weekend for the kids. Um, the Monday, it's a, a Columbus weekend. Um, Thanksgiving in Canada, if you didn't know. <laughs> so uh, you leave on uh, October 12th in the morning, and we drive down, we start building a house, accommodations are set up for us, food set up for us. Um, it's really a wonderful, wonderful uh, um, uh, mission. The, the people there have even expanded on their mission. They sell now coffee for fundraising. They also have... Um, some uh, grants that you can do to sponsor kids and so forth, and they give you updates. It's really an amazing, I mean, I think when Todd first did it, maybe 10 years ago, maybe longer, I think they were building about 20 homes a year, is what I heard from John Rose. Uh, last year, they did over 130 homes. And so when you drive down there and you see these communities of cardboard box homes and plywood homes, and then every so often you see these little blue uh, homes that are being built by this mission, it's really rewarding. So I encourage anybody uh, that wants to even have questions about it, step forward. Um, there's a lot of people in this church that participate on a regular basis. We'd love to expand that. We right now are expecting 30 people. We have close to maybe 15 already uh, allocated. The suggested donation is about 550 for an adult, 450 for a kid. That pays for your accommodations and food, but it also funds the actual build as well as scholarship program for the kids. So I encourage you guys all to step forward and be interested. If it's feeling you, touching you a little bit, please call, contact me or Luke. Um, what I will say and what I will constantly say is that once I cross that threshold of fear and safety and all the things that, that are going through your mind of not participating, um, it became more of an addiction of what it came, what, what came back to me, the fulfillment and the conversations I have with these amazing kids about what we have here and what they don't have there and how God really works in very mysterious ways to give those peace a place in this world as important as ours. So consider it, contact us, love to see you guys. Um, Bray and I have had the privilege of watching their lives over the last, I don't know, it's been years and years and years. And at the River Church, um, the Sextons, I want to bring up Lene. Lene, would you want to come, come on up here 
and little Nava, little Nava. Oh my gosh, cuteness is about to happen, people. And we just, just like the Accardo shared a little story about what, what happens when you get out of the country serving together, we also have opportunities to get locally connected beyond the bigger group here. So if you're not boxing with Dustin over there after the service, uh, we have these things called grounded groups, which are kicking off the week of September 15th. And if you want to know or get, let us know about you and you want to get involved, go to the um, connection page on our website and there's an information sheet you can fill out and we can get you connected to a grounded group. But Lene, um, you've just been on such a journey of profound, inspiring growth in the Lord and your whole family has. And ground, I know grounded groups were a big part of that or part of that. And so we just wanted to um, ask you, thank you so much for sharing a little bit about that story. How am I not going to cry? I just <laughs> cry all the time. Um, so when my husband and I um, came back to church about two years ago, um, after a long time away of just walking opposite of Jesus. Um, the first day back, somebody invited us to a grounded group. And I'm going to be honest, coming back to church was like, um, it wasn't with a willing heart. My heart was hard. Uh, I didn't want to be here. <clears throat> Hurt by the church. Um, basically just pride and fear and all the things, but my life was in shambles, and so this was sort of like my last-ditch effort of, like, how do I n not take down my child with me? Um, the first day back, don't pull out a baby, okay? The first day back, somebody invited us to a grounded group. I definitely did not want to go, um, but I did, and definitely didn't want to go for a few months, and a lot of the people in that group are here, and I'm not <laughs> sure how much they know of that, but my heart was hard. Um, but I just took that before the Lord, and I kept going because I knew he was asking me to do it. And over time, these people spoke truth into my life, um, modeled Jesus for me in a way that <clears throat> I had never really been open to seeing, honestly, um, and just came alongside me in my struggles. And slowly but surely, through the hands and the feet, right, we're called to be the hands and the feet of, of God, they just, my heart softened. And <clears throat> God has totally transformed my life, my family's life. Um, and these people are my people. You are my people. And um, now I live life with these people. We, we truly, like, day in, day out, live life together. Um, but more than that, I feel like we're on a joint mission. And um, God has just been so gracious and so good in taking my hardness and turning it into something that's totally soft. And it's only something God can do. That's it. Like, I've tried everything else in this world, and I just took, out, took the little bit of faith that I had. It was just... I'm happy, baby. I'm happy. Sometimes we cry happy tears. Sometimes we just have just a little bit of faith, and we take that before the Lord and say, you know, for me that was saying yes to a grounded group, and he took that, and he used it. And, yeah. So, you know, when I was praying about what I was going to share, God kept saying, don't plan, don't plan. I'm a planner. He kept saying, don't plan, so I'm not planning. Um, just trying to, to feel what he wants me to say. I know there's people here who feel the nudge to join a grounded group and have maybe felt the nudge before, and whatever has stopped you, fear, pride, confusion, I'm too busy, whatever, I just encourage you to just take that leap of faith and, and, and take whatever your feelings are about doing it before the Lord and watch what happens, because I promise you, he will use it. His promises are true. And, and the grounded groups have just been a way that he has poured his love on me. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lene and Nava and Sean back there. 
Um, yeah, and these are just, they're just conversation groups. You could ask, how many of y'all are in a grounded group or have been in one? All right, so if you want to know what they're about, ask someone with their hand up after the service. Um, but great opportunities. Thank you so much. Well, we've heard a lot of stories today, and now I'm going to pray, bring up one of my best friends and my big brother in the Lord and beyond, Todd Windorf, to uh, open the word of God. And we want some eternal perspective um, from the word. So I'm going to pray for Todd as he comes up here. Lord, bless this man. Thank you so much for him, uh, the role he's had in my life and in this church. And God, we just now eagerly uh, stand around the well of your truth and your word. And our souls are thirsty, our lives are thirsty, and we need a drink. And so, God, we just now um, open our minds and hearts to what you have to say in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, James. Thank you, and good morning. Great to be with you. I think James took a Sudafed instead of a vitamin C this morning. He's just a little off, don't you think? And normally he's a little bit, like, a lot more energetic, but I think he was just being easy on you. Uh, knowing that I was next. Well, it's great to be back. Uh, we took some time in July, and uh, I, I can honestly say it's not that we didn't do anything. We did a lot. A lot happened. And, uh, but uh, God is faithful, and uh, he brought us back, and, and uh, we are back kind of in the saddle. But it was um, uh, a decent size amount of time for us to reflect and respond to a crisis in our family, uh, and, um, and spend some time with some dear friends, and spend some time in the Word, uh, kind of just uninterrupted time, which we all need at some point in our lives to find some, some time where we're not disrupted. Um, I want to begin this message by giving you the title and the title of this message is from Matthew chapter 4. Andy just read the passage. It's the passage that we're going to read, which is the story of Jesus walking on the Sea of Galilee and calling his disciples. It's actually the, probably, I would say, the, the inauguration of Jesus' ministry. It's the beginning of the gospel. It's where everything starts. Without this call, without this encounter, uh, there's nothing else to follow. And so this is a critical, decisive move on Jesus' part, and he's saying something very, very important, extremely critical to you and I this morning about our faith and our walk with the Lord. And this, the, the title is The Seemingly Innocuous yet semi-dangerous call of the disciples. You, you think it's, it's, it's really not that big of a deal, at least from their perspective, and yet what they discovered, it was, it was semi-dangerous, if not full-on dangerous to follow Jesus. And I believe we've reached a point in our American culture and society today where if you make a stand for Jesus, and I'm not, making, I'm not saying make an obnoxious stand. I didn't say obnoxious. And I didn't say weird, bizarre, strange. I'm saying just taking a stand with your life for something that you believe in, in this culture, it's going to be semi-dangerous. It just will be. So just know that going into it. And so I want to read the text with you, uh, with you this morning because Jesus once said three words, come, follow me, and 12 men did, and so did others. And yet, I, I don't want to give you the illusion that it was life happy after that. It was not happy go life after they decided to follow Jesus. In fact, quite the opposite. But I will say this, that if you asked anybody in the first century that followed after Jesus, those that went to their deaths, those that suffered greatly, I guarantee you they would say that it was the best decision of their lives. And yet many of us 
live with the dilemma, do I dare trust Jesus and follow him? I mean, seriously, do I really need a handler in my life? I'm very, very capable. I, I'm good at time management sometimes. I know how to handle my finances. Generally speaking, I make good decisions. I read. I'm observant. I, I'm speaking for all of us, right? And, and we don't need really a handler. You know what a handler is. Somebody that walks literally alongside of you because you're super, super rich and you can afford this person to stand there and hold your phone and tell you what your next appointment is and guide you so that you don't have to think about any of those things. It's somebody in your life that's helping guide you forward. And I'm not suggesting that Jesus is a handler. He's far more than that. So here's the text. It's in Matthew chapter 4. Andy read it, and I'm just going to make some general observations, and then I'm going to make three significant points about what it means to follow Jesus, okay? And I may not even get through all three of those points, but the good news is this is part one of a, a two-part message, and next week is part two. Lord willing. And so here we are in this section where Jesus is now going about, it says, uh, all of the countryside. And it says that he was saying, repent for this kingdom is at hand. And he's saying, metaneo, repent, change your ways. Repent, change your mind, change your thinking, change your life, change your whole orientation. That's Jesus' message. Jesus is saying, listen to me. The kingdom of God is here. Something new has invaded planet Earth. Something spectacular. God's presence through Christ has invaded your world, and we are to change our way of thinking. And then he saw... It says, walking along this sea, he saw these fishermen, two pair actually. And he said these profound three words, duete, opiso, mu. You thought James was the only one who could read Greek here, but I can, I can read it not as well as him, but here it is, really important, duete, and it literally means, come to me. Hey, you, come over here. Come, pay attention. I, I want to pull you out of your distractions and your life and the way you're thinking and the way you're doing life. Just come here. Come here. Just come here. Have you ever had one of those kind of moments where someone just pulled you in close, maybe too close, Maybe in a creepy way, way too close. So you took a step back. I'm fine here. What do you have to say? And then Jesus says, Opiso, Mu, I want you to be an apprentice of mine. Follow me. Literally follow me. Come follow after me, was his word. That's it. That's what Jesus says. And then it says, I will send you out and make you people who fish for other people. He used the fishing analogy here. So he takes what they're doing and says, I'm going to one-up you. You're fishing for fish, but I've got a greater purpose for your life that supersedes what you do, who you marry, your prosperity, your job, your career, all the things that we value in this life, I'm going to one-up you. I'm going to challenge you to a greater purpose, and that is to rethink your life on this basis that you're going to go after people and impact their lives because I'm going to impact your life because you're going to become an, a, a follower of me, an apprentice. And then it says this. They sat down and thought about it a while. They asked their father. They consulted with their financial advisor. 
They called their accountant. They went and had a big event and, uh, and brought in all their good friends to think this through, whether this was a good idea. No, it says literally, Eutheos, Eutheos. Eutheos is a word that Mark uses in his gospel more than the other gospels. And it says, it literally means immediately, immediately, without thought, without, without hesitation, I should say, they, they follow Jesus. They immediately, it says, they ditched, all that they had, their nets, and they followed, akuletheo, they followed Jesus. There was a call, there was a response, and there was a complete reorientation of their life. And it doesn't mean all will go well with your life just because you follow Jesus. When they got out of those bo their boats, and they left their fishing nets and their profession and their parents and their family and all of their attachments to follow after Jesus, literally. And I think that's why it's in the text because we somehow under-spiritualize and underperform in this passage. We have this sense of underperformance, like, well, if you just believe you'll be fine. That what Jesus is offering is not a change in my lifestyle or a change in my orientation or my career. And it may not be, but it most certainly is a reorientation of your entire lifestyle that supersedes everything else you do. And that's what Jesus is calling his disciples to. And I want to encourage us to rethink how we approach our faith. Does that make sense? I'll keep going because I know this is possibly dense. It doesn't mean all will go well or that you will have a holy response in every bad circumstance as a result of following Jesus. Yesterday was a classic example. My son and his wife and their son are down for a couple days our other kids came over and all the grandkids. And so we had six grandkids and running around all under six. And if, to give you a perspective, it'd be like you inviting three couples to your home and every single individual decides to do something different in your home. One is rifling through your bookshelves, pulling them out. The other one is going through your pantries. The refrigerator and the freezer are open. Outside, the other person is rearranging your patio. And you're looking around going, what in the heck is going on? There are six people here, and they're all doing something different. Can't we all just get along? That's what it's like. And I lost my cheat. And... The reason why is because that was coupled with the fact that our stinking refrigerator is going out. And it's slowly going out, and then it comes back in the evening, and then it slowly goes out during the day, and it's literally pissing me off. You can't get help when you need it. So I'm at Smart and Final. I'm $150 into dry ice. And I just lost it. But I'm still a disciple of Jesus. And that's the good news. And so are you. And so are you. Thank you. And so are you. Because don't tell me you haven't done that. Because Jesus is so much more than simply you getting on board with a certain performance or program or put on some kind of a happy face in the midst of trial or difficulty or hardship or frustration. But this is a call to be with Jesus is exactly what it means to be a Christian. That's exactly what it means. They followed, immediately followed after him. I'm not even finished with the passage. And so they, they get up and go. And going along from there in verse 21, he saw two more brothers, 
Like two aren't enough? You're disrupting two people. Now you're going to disrupt four people and all their families. And he sees them and it's, it's James and, and John. And they were also in this boat with their patros, their father, big word, patros, head of the family. Son, you will be a fisherman. That is your job. That is your career. You will follow me into this career, and your life will be based upon this family business. We got a pizza shop. Somebody's got to run it. We need pizzas. And Jesus disrupts a family system. And then it says, Jesus again Kaleo calls to them, and Eutheus, again, Eutheus, immediately, Eutheus. The word Eutheus literally means in <clears throat> something within them knew this was the right decision. It wasn't that they were stupid or that they, some odd looking bearded man with a white robe is walking along the beach. And he says, hey, you, come over here. I want you to follow me. And you're thinking, this is crazy. I don't know this person. They're strangely dressed. And who are they? And why would I do that? Because I have a job. I have a family. I have an orientation. I, I know where I'm going in life. And we think of this passage like that, don't we? Like, what in the world is going, how could these people do that? And I want you to take a deeper dive into this to understand the psyche, to understand what's behind this, because this is really important, you guys. Because a lot of you... may have grown up hearing that, hey, you need Jesus as a young person, maybe, so that you don't go to hell. And you knew that, and it scared you that I'm one of them. I heard it when I was on a beach in San Onofre. This pastor got all the kids together and said, young people, you need to have a relationship with Jesus so when you die, you don't go to hell, but you go to heaven. And my brother and I are like, we're in. I'm in. Like, That's the easiest decision I've ever made in my life. I I don't want to go to hell when I die. And I was thinking fire and flames and all of that. And I was frightened. Honestly, I made that decision. You, You may be here and maybe you realized I need Jesus and you've come to the end of your rope or you've gone through a crisis in your life and Jesus saved you. And you're here because Jesus came into your life at a time in your life when you needed Jesus more than anything else. He was the answer. And no one was going to dissuade you from that because you see the difference in your life. And that's great. That's a fantastic starting place. I'm throwing in with Jesus. Or maybe someone told you God loves you and Jesus died for your sins and has forgiven you. And that's the one thing you needed is forgiveness. You needed someone to forgive you for your past. And if God knew your past, you know you are far from God. And the last thing you want in this life is to to go into eternity with a broken relationship with God. And you made that decision. And you did it. Great. And you're here, and that's your thinking. And you're thinking, the God of the universe thinks that highly of me, I'm in. Whatever whatever your starting point is, I just want to clear something up with you, and here it is. When you prayed, when you came to Jesus, when you made that decision, and maybe this morning you've never made that decision, I'm in, Jesus. This is the most important decision in your life, and you're not going to think, you're not going to let other people dissuade you because they're telling you something that's not true. Oh, you can't believe all that stuff. It was written way after. I had a guy literally got out of the swimming pool on Monday, finished swimming 3,500 yards, changing, and some guy walks up and says, all that stuff in the gospel was written way after Jesus. 
Like, where did that come from, first of all? And what am I, the scapegoat? Like, if you have a problem with God, come to me and yell at me because it's my fault. Like, what is that about? It was hilarious. And then it got me thinking, all the things that I wanted to sit down and sit down and let me tell you, you're an intelligent person. Let me give you some data. Let me tell you the history about Christ. Let me tell you when the gospels are actually written and why historians actually believe that. Intelligent people actually have studied this and have discovered that the gospels were written not many years, within 30 years after Christ, within the first generation of believers. It was written down. This was common understanding and knowledge. I could go on and on and on. But when you prayed, you said yes to Jesus, you agreed to come close to Jesus for the rest of your life and follow him as a pupil, an apprentice, and learn from him, and your life will begin to be shaped by his influence. That's what you did. You may not know it. You may not be there, and that's fine. That's okay. Maybe you're not there yet. But when you said yes to Jesus, guess what? You are in this passage. This is you in a boat fishing with your father. And Jesus calls you out of that and says, come follow me. And you got out of that boat and you're following after Jesus. That's what it means to be a Christian. That is what it means to be a Christian. To get out of the boat, to follow after Jesus for the rest of your life. Does that make sense? It's not just something you believe. It's not just something that you practice. It's not just something that I, I'm holding on to this. And now I carry on with my life. No, Jesus says, come, hey, come here. I'm going to save you from yourself. And I want you to follow me because it's going to be a better life. It will. It <clears throat> may not all work out, but it's going to be a better life. I guarantee that. And that's what he's saying. Are you good with that? Are you, are you okay with that? Because that's what you signed up for. Well, I didn't. I just heard I won't go to hell. Or I'm, not, I'm just trying to figure it all out. I knew that when I die, I'd go to heaven. I did it because I was really in a bad place and I knew Jesus could fix all that. Well, I just read you something just for 12 men in 32 AD. 32 AD. Or did I read something for you? Yeah, these disciples, and Jesus went around, he took a tax collector, he took people down on their luck, he took people in careers, he took these young men, but, he's, but, but is he really asking me to do the same thing, to be a disciple of Jesus? It's for every single person on the beach this morning. And I want to correct your thinking and reorient you to the very purpose of your life. You have one purpose, and it's to be an apprentice of Jesus. I just want to throw out a new idea maybe for you. When you get up tomorrow morning, I want you to say to yourself, I'm an apprentice of Jesus. When I said yes to Jesus, I said yes to following him, and guess what he called me? His apprentice. I'm an apprentice. Come to me, be close to me, follow my every move, my teachings, my lifestyle, become like me, that's your purpose. So just a couple observations, and then maybe I'll hit just uh, point one and end. So Jesus calls his disciples to follow him, and either this was no big deal to these fishermen. Okay, sure, why not? Of course. It's, it's like, put yourself in this situation. It's hard for us to put ourselves in this situation. We're not living in the first century. This is a Jewish culture totally different cultural trends and societal trends and expectations, completely different reality than ours, completely. So for us, we're like, how could this possibly well be? Of course I will do that. Our response oftentimes is, wait a minute, are you serious? This is a big deal. You're asking a lot of me, this will alter my entire life. But I want you to decide which one it is for you. And what we know about this passage is in many ways, the first act of Jesus is an itinerant rabbi. The inauguration of his three and a half years is to choose disciples. And what does that mean for us? So we had this staff meeting 
And we decided that this fall, we're going to come back to something that's in our vision statement. And if you know our vision statement, we are hopelessly, highly relational church. James mentioned it this morning. Hopelessly, highly relational church. And guess what? Committed to the words and ways of Jesus. Devoted, devoted and committed to that. Desiring life change and cultural renewal here in the South Bay and beyond all for the glory of God. That's our purpose. That's what we exist as a church for. And the first part of that is about being committed to the words and ways of Jesus. And so we're going to be focusing on this idea of what does it mean to get out of that boat and, 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 and hear the words, duete, come here, come here. I want you to follow me. I want you to be my apprentice. And we're going to be reading this book by John. I don't know why he has three names. I have two. It doesn't make any sense to me. And if I ever met the guy, I would tell him, why, did you, why does everybody call you John Mark Comer? Just, you're John. Aren't you just John? I don't know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give him grief. Practicing the way, but it's a fantastic book. Remarkable be- book. Pastor from uh, Portland, Oregon, now down here in Santa Monica and um, at a church, the Vintage Church. Fantastic guy. Great thinker. He's really captured in a contemporary way what it really means to be a follower of Jesus. And we're going to read that book together. So I encourage you to go online to Amazon and buy that book. You can listen to it free on Spotify if you have premium. Practice the way. We're going to, we're going to be reading it together to just get our minds around this idea of what it's like. And so we had this staff planning day, and I was supposed to bring some some of my heady material on disciples. I've been studying discipleship for a long time. When I was at Talbot School of Theology, uh, working on my master's in Divinity, then went right into a master's in theology, I was training under, you know, several professors, but one in particular um, I really respected. I mean, I loved all my professors, and he took a liking to me and allowed me to, to use his office and his library, and I began teaching for him during my THM. I, I would actually substitute teach for his, some of his classes and then began doing research for him for his book, Following the Master, Dr. Mike Wilkins. And he really influenced my thinking about discipleship, and I've been thinking about discipleship since I was a Christian. I've been actually discipled, that is mentored by someone in my life since Bill McPhee back in high school. He was my first mentor, and I felt like I was a disciple of his. I'm going to change that thinking just a little bit, but that's okay if you think that way. And we were in worship, and I, was, I had all this stuff to share, and then, boom, it's the weirdest thing. I don't know whether, have you ever, has it ever happened to you, where literally the Lord just says, open up Matthew chapter 4, and I didn't need to because I already knew the passage because I read it so many times, Matthew 4, verse 19, to the passage where Jesus tells his disciples to follow him, and then three ideas just like that pop into my head. Oh, my gosh. Just like that, my message came together. I knew exactly what God wanted to say. He gave me three observations to this experience, and here they are. Here are the three observations. We'll look at them next week. But here they are. If, you don't, if you're not coming back next week, here they are. Number one, they understood a context that you and I don't understand, and that's why they decided to follow Jesus, Eutheos, immediately. The reason why they decided immediately to step up and follow Jesus, like, well, of course I'll do that. <clears throat> why would I not do that? You'd be crazy to pass up an opportunity like this is because they understood a Jewish culture of rabbinic training that was deeply embedded in first century culture. And every young boy, sadly it was not girls as well, but in today's day it would be young boys and girls literally being influenced by a teacher of God's word. And they understood that culture. And we don't understand that culture. 
And because they understood that culture, they said yes. The second thing is, these men were no longer five and six. <clears throat> they were no longer 12 and 13. They had been passed over the process in their own society. They were not selected. They were fishermen, tax collectors, other kinds of individuals that had found themselves embedded in society and felt like God had passed over them. They literally felt that way. And when Jesus shows up on the shore and says, hey, I'm giving you an opportunity of a lifetime, they immediately dropped their nets, left their father and followed him. Because they had been once passed over and now they've been given an opportunity of a lifetime that they are not gonna let go of. It was that good. And number three, the reason why they got out of their boats is because they valued their spiritual life as much as they valued even more than their prosperity. And those three things just popped into my head and that's exactly what happens in this text. That's why they got out of the boat because they lived in a spiritual, a culture that believed that the spiritual realm is all around us, it's right here. And there's an interaction with the spiritual that impacts your life. Your relationship with God impacts every aspect of your life and in that way, your life is a spiritual life. It's not like this is spiritual and then what you do after is secular. Your whole life is oriented around spiritual. Something happens. Come on in, you guys. And next week, I want to I wanna literally take a dive into those three ideas that, were, that, that are the backdrop to why these individuals decided to throw everything towards Jesus. They had a context. They had a second chance and they valued their spiritual lives. And so come back, let's talk about that. Let's look at those three things. Big introduction, big idea, and here I'm gonna leave you with one idea, just one idea. When Jesus called these young men to follow, he was calling them to be a disciple, mathetes, which is a noun. Talmid in the Hebrew, it's, a, it's an apprentice. And it's not something you do, it's something you are. You are a disciple of Jesus. You're a disciple. It's your identity, it's your core identity. And that's why I said, when you wake up in the next, tomorrow morning and you say to the Lord, I'm an apprentice of Jesus, you've re-identified re yourself. You've given yourself your core identity that controls everything about you. Now let's talk about it next week. The first step is deciding that you want to do that in Jesus' name. So Father, we come to the table now as we hear some worship and we have some time to respond. Father, may you invade our hearts and minds in Jesus' name. May you uh, lead us and may we feel like we are in a boat and we are going about our business and our lives and Jesus shows up and says, come here, come here, I love you that much. And maybe you feel far away from the Lord. Maybe you feel really abandoned. Maybe you feel hurt. Maybe you feel a lot of pain, but God is calling you close. Come here, follow me, it's gonna change your life. I pray that we would respond, yes, Lord, and get out of the boat. In Jesus' name, amen.
where I lay it down Every burden, every crown This is my surrender This is my surrender Here is where I lay it down Every lie and every doubt This is my surrender And I will make room for you Whatever you want to, do whatever you want to, I will make room for you, to do whatever you want to, do whatever you want to.
I will make room for you to do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to, and I will make room for you to do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to, to so shake up the crown all my tradition break down the walls all my religion your way is better your way is better so shake up the crown of all my tradition break down the walls all my religion your way is better your way is better and I will make room We just thank you for this time. We ask that you would bless us with a passion to follow you every day. That you would remind us of the choices that we've made and the commitment that we made to you, Father. We just ask that you would use us on this earth to seek out your glory in other people. That we would be your instruments on the earth, Father. We ask that you would just use us. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Good to see you guys.